Mash Chipano. I'm your host, Aslan Historian. The European conquest and colonization of the Americas, especially that made by Spain, is a historical process which understanding is plagued by endless misconceptions and myths that only have helped to keep useless debates and prejudices alive for centuries. Many of these myths have to do with a rather common and pernicious tendency most people have when looking at the past, and it's projecting modern concepts and values into historical societies, characters and events. And today I want to focus on a particular tendency many people have when looking at the European conquests in the Americas, and it's to imagine the indigenous American peoples as some sort of monolithic entity, thinking that Native Americans had similar ideas and views regarding the European invasion of their homelands, and that when the time to face the invaders came, they all act to resist the European conquest alongside their fellow Native American peoples. Well, it needs to be said, this idea is delusional. The attitudes, actions and roles of the indigenous American peoples and leaders during the European conquests of the Americas were far more diverse than what many people usually imagine. Say diversity is a reflection of the history, politics, ideas and identities of the native peoples, and today we are going to talk about one of the less known roles of the indigenous peoples in the European conquest of the New World their role as conquistadores. American who? Okay, I suppose I need to explain how I can say there were indigenous American conquistadores. But first, let's get rid of a pretty persistent misconception that most people seem to have about the European Amerindian encounter the idea that Native Americans saw each other as fellow inhabitants of the same homeland. Before the Colombian contact, each cultural region in the Americas had pretty much their own known world, and in none of those visions of the world, the Americas appeared as a whole. That means that, for example, the Haudenosaunee didn't know about peoples like the Zapotec or the Taino, or that the Mapuche didn't know about the Kichemaya or the Timucua. Also, we need to remember that for the different indigenous American nations, the other peoples and countries beyond their borders were just as foreign to them as European nations were to each other. For example, for the Aztec, the Purépecha and the Tlaxcaltec were foreigners, just like the Moroccans and Portuguese were to the Spaniards. And like their old world counterparts, the Native American nations had their own politics and diplomacy and therefore their own complex relationships with each other over the centuries. Alliances, rivalries, trade partnerships, all had place in the new world before the arrival of Columbus, and they would have a decisive role in the shaping of the colonial world in the centuries to come. The enemies of their enemies Now that we clarify that the indigenous American nations saw each other as foreigners and that they had complex and not always peaceful relationships with each other, we can begin to visualize how the Europeans, particularly the Spaniards, came to have a solid base of native allies in their New World campaigns. Some indigenous nations, like the Republic of Tlaxcalan and the Tutulxio Kingdom, which had extremely hostile relationships with their neighbors, gladly welcomed the Europeans as help in their own military affairs, and so they provided the Spaniards not only with solid bases for their expeditions, but more importantly, they provided troops for the conquistadores. The contribution in soldiers done by the indigenous allies of the conquistadores is often overlooked by the traditional narrative which insists in portraying a conflict between natives and conquistadores in which both Europeans and indigenous peoples are two well-differentiated sides. But the truth is that said vision couldn't be farther from the historical reality, as indigenous peoples fought both against and alongside the Europeans, and in many cases, they actually were the main muscle of the conquering armies. For example, when Cortés laid siege on Tenochtitlan, the army he commanded was composed by approximately 
1,300 Spaniards and 200,000 indigenous warriors, mainly Tlaxcaltecs and Acolhuas. This means that the quote-unquote Spanish force that conquered the Aztec Triple Alliance was actually almost entirely indigenous, as Spaniards only made up 1% of the troops in said army. And this situation was far from unique to Mesoamerica, as the forces that laid siege on Cusco, led by Diego de Almagro and Hernando Pizarro, were almost entirely made up by native soldiers too, with the Spaniards accounting for less than 3% of the soldiers in the Spanish side. Also, it's necessary to point out that such huge armies, being made up almost entirely by native soldiers, had to be led by native commanders, as Spanish officers were scarce, they didn't have enough translators, and they weren't fluent in any local language. Commanders like the Tlaxcaltec warriors Aishashekatl, Tecpanecatl, Cuautotowa, and Xicotencatl Axayacatzin in Cortes forces, and the Cañari chiefs Ilchumlai and Chilche in Pizarro's army, were essential for the success of the Spanish conquest campaigns. Yet, their names are rarely mentioned in history classes alongside the names of their Hispanic associates. Besides nations siding with the Spaniards for the sake of ending all feuds with their neighbors, there were also other kinds of native allies that supported the conquistadores in their campaigns, including rebels like the Totonac and Cañari peoples, who sided with the Spaniards to oppose the Aztec and Inca domination respectively, and local traitors, like the Colwa ruler Ixtisochit II and the Inca prince Manco Inca Yupanqui, who joined forces with the conquistadores in order to further their political agendas. Indios amigos, indios auxiliares, and yanaconas. So far, we've only talked about the fall of the great indigenous American powers at the time of the Colombian contact, which took place to the combined actions of traditional enemies, local rebels, opportunist traitors, and Spanish conquistadores. But the Spanish Americas were way bigger than just the former territories of the Excantatoyocan and the Tahuantinsuyu, and the conquest of those territories also relied heavily on indigenous American collaboration, as the newly conquered peoples became the main muscle of the new conquest campaigns alongside the original native allies that helped the first conquistadores. Tlaxcaltec and Otomi soldiers, as well as former Aztec warriors, joined the Spaniards as Indios Auxiliares and participated in expeditions of conquest in places as far as New Mexico, Texas, Guatemala and even the Philippines. People from other Mesoamerican nations, such as Zapotecs, Mixtecs and Chorotegas also collaborated with the conquistadores in their expeditions. For example, when Pedro de Alvarado launched his own expedition to the Inca Empire in 1534, among his forces he brought Nahua, mainly Tlaxcaltecs, and Maya warriors, probably Quiches, to fight against the Andean peoples. And speaking of the Andes, the trend to rely on native allies and use conscript locals as foot soldiers was continued by the conquistadores that ventured into South America. For example, Sebastián de Belalcazar was supported by local Inca vassals, colloquially referred as Corejones, and their retainers in his expedition to present-day Colombia. Another example would be the expedition of Diego de Almagro to present-day Chile, in which the conquistador led 500 Spaniards, 100 African slaves, and 3,000 native troops although some sources put the number of indigenous soldiers in Almagro's expedition as high as 20,000. Here we need to differentiate between the service Indians, known locally as Yanaconas, and the Indios Amigos. The Yanaconas were people who supported the expeditions by serving the conquistadores, while the Indios Amigos were indigenous warriors who joined the expeditions out of their own interest in obtaining land and spoils. Now, both the Indios Amigos and the Indios Auxiliares, especially those of Tlaxcaltec origin, view themselves as equals of the conquistadores, as their allies, not as their servants, and certainly they didn't see themselves as being of the same condition as the peoples they conquered, although eventually 
through diverse political maneuvers, the Spaniards would eventually subject them and their descendants to the same treatment as the peoples they once helped to conquer. The New History of the Conquest As we have seen, the Spanish colonial expansion in the New World was not something accomplished by small parties of conquistadores alone, as the Spaniards heavily relied on massive armies of indigenous American allies to establish their dominance over the Americas. The Spanish conquests in the Americas were a series of international conflicts in which some native nations sided with Spain against their enemies, hoping that the weapons of the foreigners could give them a decisive advantage in the battlefield, and in which Spain would also make use of its new Native American subjects to fight the still unconquered neighbors for almost three centuries. And Spain wasn't alone in doing that, as other European powers also relied on Native allies and subjects to fight their colonial wars in the New World, from the Haudenosaunee English alliance in the Beaver Wars to the armies of Tupi warriors led by the Portuguese Bandeirantes against the Guarani during the War of the Oranges in 1801. So, if Native Americans had such a huge role in the European domination of the New World, then why is that most people aren't aware of this historical fact? The answer to that has to do with a series of misconceptions and prejudices that began to be crafted in the colonial period, when Europeans wanted to make sure to have control over the land by depriving both conquered and allied natives of any political influence over the colonies, as much as possible. Myths and ideas like the noble savage trope led to romanticize depictions of the Native Americans, in which they were portrayed as helpless victims of the evil Europeans, and not as politically invested agents of their own destiny. Also, at least in many Latin American countries, nationalistic rhetoric framed the main pre-Columbian nations of the Americas as being ancient versions of modern countries like Mexico or Peru, all in a gross oversimplification of the political and cultural landscape of said lands at the time of the European conquest. This distortion of the pre-Columbian past to fit a nationalist rhetoric was part of a 19th century global trend, and that view has continued to influence the way in which many people understand the European conquest and colonization of the Americas today. It wasn't until the second half of the 20th century that new studies on historical sources, both from Europe and the Americas, allowed the scholars to finally understand how the European conquest of the Americas truly took place, as well as the roles of indigenous peoples in that process, both as defenders of their homelands and as allies of the European conquerors. By the 1990s, the evidence recovered by researchers had pretty much shattered the traditional view of the conquest in academia, especially in regards to the Spanish colonial expansion, thus marking the birth of a new way of understanding this historical process, a new academic paradigm simply known as the new history of the conquest. Researchers like James Lockhart, Matthew Restall, Michel Ojik and Jorge Gamboa Mendoza have helped to reshape our understanding of the European, mainly Spanish, conquest of the Americas and the role of the native peoples in said process by bringing back all documents and sources that have helped to understand the relationships between Europeans and Native Americans, as well as the names and lives of individuals that took part in said events. That's how names like Pablo Pax Bolón, Francisco Celote, Gonzalo Masatzin Moctezuma, Jerónimo Huacrapaucar, Fernando de Tapia Conin, and Aku Kumshu are finally coming back from the oblivion and allowing us to give a name and a face to this neglected side of the history of the Americas. Certainly, the idea of indigenous conquistadores in the Americas is troublesome for many people, as it doesn't fit with the traditional narrative regarding those events, but the truth is that the success of the European conquests in the Americas was possible thanks to the collaboration of the native peoples and their leaders. And while it's true that many natives and their leaders 
were forced to cooperate with the Europeans, like the Mapuche chief Michimalongo and the Cueva ruler Careta, it's also true that many nations and their leaders joined forces with the Europeans out of their own interest, and not only with the Spaniards, as was the case of the Temenino chief Ariboya, who joined forces with the Portuguese. So, as historical evidence shows us, the process of conquest and colonization of the Americas by Europeans was far more complex than what traditional historical narratives tell, and research only compels us to accept a crucial fact, that our understanding of the role of indigenous peoples in said conquests needs to be completely rebuilt from scratch. The traditional narrative insists in portraying the Native Americans exclusively as being helpless victims of the European invasions, and once the great pre-Columbian nations fall, the Native Americans are pretty much removed from history, only returning as mere occasional footnotes. This way, indigenous American peoples not only lose their place in post-colonial history, they are also denied agency over their own historical fate. Nahua, Quechua, Quiche, Mapuche, Mixtec, Guarani, and other indigenous peoples of the Americas didn't just vanish in the air with the conquest. They are still here, and they have a history that's still being written, which deserves to be known and understood. And understanding the role of the indigenous peoples in the European conquest of the New World as both conquerors and defenders is going to be essential for achieving that. Thanks for watching this video everyone, if you like it, please share and subscribe, and don't forget to visit my discord, this has been Aztlan Historian, and I'll see you next time.